Thank you. Well, praise God. Um, I appreciate Carol's testimony, what the Lord's done. Um, I'm the family of six children. I was the third from the oldest. I uh, lived in 38 states in five years before, before I was 10. Uh, we enrolled in 11 schools in three months. My dad divorced, my mother and dad divorced when I was 10 years old. My mother got remarried when I was about 11 and a half, 12, to an alcoholic, retired military person. And he, his first off, he said, I'll take care of the boys. My mother's take care of the, the girl. And he said, there's two things I hate, a liar and a thief. And if you lie to me, you'll steal from me. And if you'll steal from me, you'll lie to me. And uh, my stepdad was taking, was, was storing a car for a friend of his. It was a Renault had had this, uh, the floor shift. So us boys, you know, we have nothing to do. So we just get in the car, one steers, and the other four push this car around the tree. It worked real good until the winter. We had a Christmas gift, which was a bag of tools. Each one of us had a tool kit, and we all had ball-peen hammers. And they're not just for nails. We knocked every piece of glass out of the car, all the windows, <laughs> all the windows, the gauges, the lights, everything. And uh, my mother, unbeknownst to me, I was at a friend's, and her and my siblings decided, we're going to tell Clarence that the kids down the street did it. Well, when I got home, he asked me. And I remember, I hate a liar. This is hard. And so uh, uh, I said, Clarence, we did it. Me and my brothers. My Clarence was never abusive physically to my mother. He was to us. He, would, he tongue lashed her for over an hour. My mother remembered that when I walked past her when she was cutting something up with the butcher, with the butcher knife. And uh, she went to spank me with the butcher knife. And I turned around and she hit me in the leg. And, uh, and she felt no remorse at that time. So I wrapped it up. I went in the bedroom, wrapped a sheet around it. Clarence, he, drank, he, he would drink from 5 to 9 every night. He would drink from noon to 5 on Saturday. He would take three cases home for Sunday. That was an every, every week thing. And uh, um, so when he got home, he found out what happened from my siblings. He come in. And I was probably close to 12 years old. He picked me up, carried me to the car. And he said, we're going to go to the emergency room, but you've got to tell them you are sticking a knife through a piece of wood because if you don't, they're going to take you kids away. And I got to thinking after that, I could have been a liar like the rest of them and not gone through this. <laughs> Made no sense. But... Um, um, I, we, I, I did what I was told. I lied to him, and we stayed with my mother. My stepdad passed away at 43 years old. He, uh, he had a stroke driving a vehicle down the, down the road. And uh, we went to see him two days before he died, and he said, there's two things you're never going to forget. He died in 1979, the day I'm the day I die, there's going to be a blizzard, and you won't be able to move. And the day I'm buried, there's going to be a sleet storm at the cemetery, and all the, the tent's going to come down, and all the pallbearers are going to get soaked. And it happened exactly like he said. God is so cool. My stepdad was hired at the last minute, you know, like the... the the, 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 um, the guy hired people to work, you know, at the first of the day and at the last. Well, he was hired at the last. He didn't have time, but God, he was just showing God. God was just showing him a little, little something. But uh, going through my dad divorcing my mother, my dad's name and mine were the same. 
And a, a few years later, my mother received a box in the mail. It was love letters that my mother received from my dad to her best friend for over 15, between 15 and 20 years. My mother read them. And so the hate boiled up in her and it instilled over on those children. So when we'd go down the highway and see a hobo hanging out of a train car, my mother would say, there goes your dad, but she put something else with it. He was a liar, a snake, a thief, a weasel, a bum, and a con. And uh, so when you call me Tom, at school I got in a lot of, a lot of trouble. I broke my finger when I was 13 in three places, and I, broke, I cracked this one, and I got suspended from, I got in a lot of trouble in school, because when you call me Tom, you're calling me all of that. So it took a lot of years, 26 actually. I got saved at 36 years old, but I found out that um, through life, you know, I, I got married at 20 years old. At 21 and a half, my wife divorced me. She was six months pregnant by somebody else. So you got more baggage. So you keep going. When I was about 27, you have, anybody have a muscle spasm in their leg or their arm? My whole body would do that. It would spaz out. So when I was in my 30s, my stomach would churn. I could hear it. It was just rolling. So they, they ran a scope in, and that's the first time I've ever heard they would run a scope in, and they'd keep you awake. But the doctor got down on his knees, and he pointed at the monitor, and he said, this is your stomach. The whole inside is just full of ulcers. He said, whatever's eating you, you better take care of it. And uh, so... When I was about, I see, when I was 27 too, I also got a new job. I, worked, I went to work for the government. I was a federal meat inspector. And um, I had to go to a place called, it was a red meat school is what they called it for, for beef plants. It was a three week school. When we go there, we stay at a hotel and we have, a, we have to fill out a travel voucher when we get back. We have to take everything off the hotel bill and change it over and put all the tickets, tickets for the meals on a travel voucher. Well, apparently, I put one more day on the hotel on the travel voucher than what I actually had a receipt for. I didn't know this. But when I went to work for the government, I still had all this baggage. And it ran over into everybody that I worked with, which nobody liked me. And... Uh, so my bosses would come to me and say, do you want to change anything? I said, what do I need to change? I've never done this before. So none of them, none of, nobody would help me. I had no, no friends to help me. So what they did, they turned me in for falsifying government documents. And be, since I didn't have my three years in yet, I could get terminated for that. <clears throat> but as an inspector, we belonged to the union, so I talked to my president of my local and he was good friends with all the big shots he knew them by name he knew their wives names all the kids names so I, call, I called him and he said just sit in my office and be quiet I'll take care of it I ended up getting a letter in my file for one year and I said but there's a problem I said I've overcharged the government for this hotel it was thirty dollars what do I do with it he said if the government does not ask for money you do not do anything but I said, but I was always taught to be, a, to be, even a sinner, I was taught to be honest. I was taught to respect my elders. I was taught to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And I was taught the seniors. I was always taught to help them whenever they need it. I was taught to do all the right things in, in those areas and taught to be honest. And uh, he said, you know, I said, what about if I take a check, write it out for that amount, send it to the United States Department of Agriculture, attention Dr. Isom out of Dallas. And Dr. Isom, he was, a, he was the head of the Southwest region. That means that he was in charge of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, and Arkansas, in charge of all of that. 
And uh, up to that point, I was the biggest pain in their backside in the government. It was, it was that bad. <laughs> and uh, he said, go ahead and do that and see what happens. I got a letter back. Dr. Isom hand wrote me a letter and said, Inspector Russell, thank you very much for this, this money, but we don't know what to do with it. We've never had this happen before. Somebody give money back that it was not requested. So that was in my file. And a year later, I've always, you know, you always hear some, some man hit, hit his wife or hit a girl. Men do not hit women. Cowards. <laughs> cowards that are too lazy and too, too big of cowards. They hit children and they hit women. That's what a coward is, not a man. So, but um, later, one of my supervisors come up, and I still had all this anger and all this stuff built up over the years, and he started screaming at me, and I just reached over and grabbed him by the neck, and so that <laughs> got, me in, got me in more trouble, <laughs> so, and uh, so these five guys that wanted me fired, they started calling the big bosses, one in Minneapolis, they called Dr. Isom in, in Dallas. Everybody was on board except for Dr. Isom. He called up, and my, soup, my head supervisor had to take my place for 30 minutes in the middle of the day working my job. And Dr. Isom said, Inspector Russell, do you have anybody on your side? And I said, no, sir. I said, everybody I know hates my guts. Because... I could, I could be standing next to somebody and they could look at me and I'd ask them what they're looking at. What's your problem? I'd strike out and then ask questions. That's just the way I was. And um, I said, no, sir. I said, I have no friends. No friends. And he said, well, he said, in, in, in the USDA, all the, all the big shots are all veterinarians. And, my, and Dr. Isom said, I don't believe these five veterinarians. They were all his kind of guys, you know, that group. He said, Inspector, I'm going to have to give you a week off without pay for insubordination. He said, what do you think? And I said, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I took a vacation. I went to Eureka Springs for a week. And um, when I got back, and I, was still kind of, I wasn't saved yet, and I got back, and Dr. Marr, my circuit supervisor, come up, and he said, well, Inspector, what did you learn? I said, well, Doc, I said, it takes five to get me a week off without pay. How many does it take to fire me? And so I was kind of mouthy. But um, later on, I, uh, I, was, I was married again, and I have a daughter. And she's in her 40s now. But her mother, I, I came home from a funeral. I had a, my best friend in the world was a Jehovah Witness. And, I, and uh, I got a call at five in the morning and Valerie, his wife, called and said, Michael killed himself like it was, like it was nothing, like it was just, oh, just another thing in, in life. And I said, so what, you know, I couldn't figure out what happened, so I called the sheriff. He, he, sealed, he, um, he, he loved to work on vehicles. He could, he makes show bikes and chop vehicles down and just do all kinds of stuff. He had long hair in the middle of his back, wore granny glasses. Him and I worked next to each other for three and a half years as a meat cutter when I worked for IBP before I went to the USDA. And so I called the sheriff, and they said he, they found him. They, he hooked up his coat to the exhaust pipe and a plastic bag around it, and he was laying inside it. But his dad killed himself, too, I found out. And then I went to the funeral, and I come back, and his little son was in the backyard. And this is before I, I got saved. And Micah was his name. And he pointed at the windows in his daddy's garage, and he said, if I wouldn't have broke them windows, my daddy wouldn't have killed himself. I didn't know about God, but I knew if he didn't get some help, he's going to hurt himself or somebody else. So... I, I end up um, at going home from that, 
and there were divorce papers waiting on the table. So uh, um, the, the t- papers are on the table, so I, I'd already been going to a church. I was, sitting, I was in a church for almost a year. I was paying $2 in the plate like everybody else. I'd, when they were preaching, I was working in the coloring book with my daughter, and I'd sing some of the songs. I, was, I figured I was as good as anybody else in that building. You know, I didn't hear the gospel. And, uh, but after that, the divorce papers come up, and my friend killed himself. I said, that pastor's got to be there for more than just Sunday morning. I went behind the church, and I saw his wife, and I asked if I could speak to him. And he came out. <clears throat> Vicky has met him. He's, he's still a good friend. And uh, he got in the truck, and he said, what do you need? And I said, well, I said, my best friend killed himself. My wife just divorced me. He said, what do you feel like doing? I said, well, I just want to grab somebody and just beat them up. (laughs) And uh, he said, you know, He said, I think I know what you need. I said, what's that? He said, you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I said, how do I get Jesus? And he told me. And I was 36 years old. Never had peace. (laughs) From the time... My dad left. 26 years. And uh, the hate I had toward my dad drove me because I'd look in the KOA camps and I'd look for him. My dad, through the years, we were growing up, he would come and get my big brother and he would get my next to the youngest and he wanted nothing else to do with us four. So that just added fuel to the fire. And um, so it, it, it just, the baggage just keeps coming. But when I got saved, I'll tell you, my, I had peace for the first time. It just felt like this, this, the, the weight was gone. My friend still killed himself, and I still got divorce papers, but I had peace for the first time. <clears throat> I just praise God for that. But then I, I figured, you know, as an inspector, you work three years, you, get a, you can put in for promotion. So I figured I was on the line 16 years at that time. People didn't like me to the point where they were not going to sign those papers. So I filled out papers, sent them in. My boss from our area office called me, and he said, as long as I'm alive, you will never get a promotion. I said, wow, this isn't fair. <laughs> I worked the line 16 years. I should get by now. And so I went and told my pastor. He said, let's pray that God will remove all obstacles. We figured, well, he'd get a promotion or he'd retire. <clears throat> and the man was 50 years old that called me at that time. And I, and they have erasable boards in the, in the office. And on that board, it said, Dr. Swan died of a massive heart attack while jogging. He never had heart problems. He, he ran five miles a day every day before work. That scared me. I said, this God thing is serious. And I said, you know, after getting saved and realizing... <clears throat> A person that has hate, bitterness, unforgiveness against somebody. If I had all this hate toward Joe, he doesn't feel a thing. It's like you're wanting him to die and you're drinking the poison. And I've had, out when I was still an inspector, I, 
somebody told me that was standing next to me said, you're, real, you're pale, you need to go get looked at. So I went to the nurse, they sent me to the hospital, they said my blood pressure was 180 over 120. They went in and did the, the dye test. They said your bottom one inch of your heart is gone. So I do realize in life when you, when you sin and, and you know the stress and the hate and the anger that I had all those years, God can deliver you from it, but you've got scars that most people can't see. And uh, you live with that. But I'm here to tell you, <clears throat> there's nothing you can't forgive anyone for. If you're the innocent person of, of something that's been done wrong, you can still go to that person and say, I forgive you, please forgive me. If they don't, and if they were the guilty and you were the innocent, you're still free from that bondage. And that's what this is about. It's a chain of hate, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And if you want to step out of the boat, you're going to have to get rid of the chains of hate, bitterness, and unforgiveness. If you step out the boat and you still have this garbage on, you're not going to be able to use, be used by God. God can't use you if you still have all the unforgiveness. And that's all I have to say to you. I love stories like that. Amen. He had no friends. Everybody hated him. He hated everybody. But then Jesus comes along, and he can get through into areas that no man can get through. And many of us uh, can relate with that. And uh, I just, uh, Tom, thank you. I know you guys, um, you drove <laughs> many hours, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you have friends. Yeah, his pastor's right hand man, Brother Glenn. It was telling me, climb out of the boat, take a walk on the way. Some places you'll never go till you step out. Just climb out of the boat.